Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about something that I really love. I mean, I dedicated my whole professional life to this particular question. How does Christianity stack up against the great world religious traditions? How does, how does Christianity fare in a world of religions? I became a Christian as a senior in high school, and one of the big questions I had uh, after becoming a Christian was, you know, sure, this Jesus thing sounds good, uh, but, you know, I know nothing about Buddhism or Islam or Hinduism or Mormonism. And how do I know for sure that I've really got the goods, you know, and I've really not compared it to the others? And so that sent me off on kind of a, a, a long journey, which ended up, you know, putting me into a doctoral program in religious studies up at UC Santa Barbara. So I got a chance to study these great world religious traditions from stem to stern, from people who were great scholars in these fields, uh, to people who were devotees and practitioners on the ground. And so it was a wonderful opportunity to compare my Jesus love and Bible reading ways to these other great world religious traditions. So uh, well, let me boil down that whole experience for you so, so that you don't have to go do that. Well, I kind of hope some of you do. We don't have many evangelical, Jesus-loving Christians wandering through secular departments of religious studies, and I'd like to see a few more. But in case you don't do that, let me give you the bottom line. Okay, here it is. Christianity, as compared to the other great world religious traditions, studying at the highest levels. Here it is. Christianity's weird. <laughs> there, it's been said. Yep, we, we signed up for a strange one we did. Uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know why you would have leapt into this thing, but it really has some features that don't match the category of religion at all. In fact, if there's a box called religion, right now I'd be using more in the way of gestures, but I'm getting used to this. Say, say there's a box. <laughs> called religion, and, and, and you try to drop Christianity into that box, you know, representing the category of religion. You try to drop it in. Christianity doesn't go in the box. Now, you can, you can push on it. You can saw pieces off and push some more, and it really is a terrible fit. When people say to you just the word religion, certain things pop up into your mind. Even if you're a Christian or whether you're not a Christian, certain things pop into your mind I'm claiming that Christianity really doesn't fit the bill well at all. Uh, and I want to highlight some of those features that cause Christianity to be such a terrible fit for uh, the category of religion. In fact, let me hit, hit you with one straight out of the box here. Uh, the thing that really captured my imagination about Christianity, as opposed to the other great world religious traditions, set it apart, made it unique, is this, Christianity is testable. Christianity is testable. Now, what do I mean by testable? I mean that you can offer evidence for it. You can, ever, you can offer evidence against it. <laughs> and the evidence actually means something. In other words, you can actually become a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ or not uh, based on the evidence in the case. Right? And I find that to be a unique feature of Christianity. Now, maybe you're thinking, well, wait a minute. Don't, don't other religions allow that? Aren't they kind of jiggy with the idea that you can actually investigate and show these to be true? Well, no, they, they really don't. Take Zen Buddhism, for example. For goodness sakes, a Zen Buddhist hearing my little talk this morning would be going, what is that guy talking about? You know, investigation and testability. What's that all about? It has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with what's going on inside me as a Zen Buddhist. It's all about my inner experience. Do I sense that I am moving in some way closer to enlightenment through Zen meditation and Zen practices and Zen teachings and so on? That's what it's really all about. This idea of investigation is completely wrong-headed. So, uh, folks like Zen Buddhists, it's, it's not an issue at all. They, they think we're kind of crazy. And, and they, they push aside the idea of investigation and testability immediately. Uh, now, there's some religions that sound like they're testable, but when you poke and prod and ask some difficult questions, it turns out they're really not. 
Uh, I know there's a number of religions that really fall into this category, but one that's prominent here in the, in the Western states would be Mormonism. You, you've, if you live in the West, for goodness sake, you've bumped into Mormon missionaries, you know, at your door or at the, at the coffee shop, I guess not. Yeah, but, but you've... <laughs> But you've, uh, you've bumped into Mormon missionaries and such. Well, let's say, let's say you've studied up on it. And I know some of you have. I mean, you, you actually kind of wait for them by the door, you know, of your home. And one day, some, uh, you hear a knock at the door. You look out the window. There's some bicycles parked in your flower bed. You, you open the door. And there's a couple of representatives of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And... Uh, but you know the whole thing. And so, and you even have a, a strategy. You're going to let them give their teaching. And their teaching has all kinds of interesting, testable ideas. That there was a, a Latter-day prophet by the name of Joseph Smith who encountered some angels, you know, and actually encountered Jesus uh, Christ and God the Father themselves hovering in the air as a young man. Uh, he he was commissioned by an angel to go and dig up some gold plates. And he was, he was able to translate these ancient lost languages by the gift and power of God into the Book of Mormon, which tells the story of the ancient peoples of the Western Hemisphere. And all kinds of things that seem testable. And you're checking the boxes as you're listening to this story. Going, wow, that is, that is totally investigatable down the line. And so when it comes your turn to talk, you ask a few difficult questions of them. Uh, and what happens at that point? Now, I've had this happen at my door, uh, in my living room, at local Mormon wards, at Brigham Young University, and even among some of their apostles, two of whom I have on speed dial. So, you never know when you're going to need a Mormon apostle. Uh, so, uh, so what happens? So you ask a couple of questions. Here's what happens when you ask some questions that really hit the mark. They take a step back. And they say, well, you know, you're asking some good questions, but I, I don't know what to do with that exactly. What it really boils down to for me, says the missionary, is that I have had a feeling that this is true. Classically, it's called the burning of the bosom. I've had a, an inner feeling that this is true. You see, you see how it sounded like it was testable, but then when you ask certain questions, it turned out not to be testable at all. It turned out to be all about what's going on inside the Latter-day Saint standing at your door. Now, I don't want to uh, put a cloud over religious experiences. I'm actually a big fan of that. You know, bring it on, God. You know, I'll, I'll take whatever you got. Uh, but it turns out Christianity is much more than the experience. Uh, for the Mormons, I think at the end of the day, it stops at the experience. In Christianity, get, get this, Christianity is true whether you've experienced it or not. Christianity is true whether you've experienced it or not. It is objectively true. You can investigate it, and the facts of the case will tell you whether you ought to go more deeply into it. Uh, so Christianity is testable. Now, some of you are probably thinking, uh, you, you, haven't, you haven't quoted a single scripture yet. Well, well let me do this. Let me, to, to prove this basic point, let me do this. Let me read to you what I would consider to be one of the strangest passages in all of religious literature. You don't find something like this in the Bhagavad Gita or the Buddhist Tripitaka or the Quran or the Book of Mormon. This comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 12 through 19. In fact, we'll make this the text for the morning. 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 19. I'm claiming that this is the strangest passage in all of religious literature. And I've had a chance to read most of it too. So check this out. Ready? I'm just going to hit you with it. No commentary. Here it is. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. Really? He continues, more than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, 
Your faith is futile, empty, worthless would be synonyms. And you're still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Now, why would I call that one of the strangest passages in all of religious literature? Because the Apostle Paul did something crazy. He hung everything in Christianity by a thread, the thread of the resurrection. And he invited people to come along and try to snip that thing. Now, this didn't bother him too much because he had actually seen the risen Jesus himself. And, uh, and of course, he, uh, he had full knowledge that God could protect this evidence as it came down through history to us in our time. But this is a radical statement setting Christianity up for objective testing from A to Z and is a very strange feature of any religion I've bumped into. The strangest, perhaps. So I think that's one thing that sets Christianity apart from the pack, is it this testability that you can actually investigate it and determine whether it's true or not. Now, there's a lot of other features. And I, in a short time like this, I, I'd, I'd love to give a full seminar on all these things, but let me just hit you with a couple more. And I'll, I'll do this by telling you a story. All right? This is a story where I first explored some of these ideas with kind of a crazy community college class. So, I'm minding my own business at my Biola University office, and I get a call. Right? I pick up the call. It's a, it's a transfer call from the university operator. Uh, turns out somebody was calling the university looking for a fundamentalist. <laughs> and uh, uh, so... Uh, in fact, I'm making this part up, okay? I have no idea what was going on. But I do know that the, this, there was a class down at Long Beach City College, a world religion survey class. They're getting towards the end of the term, and they're looking for guest speakers to represent various religions, right? So they got a Catholic priest, they got a Buddhist monk. They're looking for some sort of, you know, a wild-eyed fundamentalist, I guess, to expose to the class, you know? Uh, well, let the, you know, bring them in in a cage and let the, let the students get near them. <laughs> Uh, and so, uh, this, this part, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm making it up. The, the, the transfer call comes, and uh, uh, so there's a guy on the other end of the line, and he says, uh, oh, this part I'm not making up. This is the part. I'll tell you when I'm making stuff up. <laughs> the guy on the other end of the phone, uh, when I get the transfer call, he says, uh, hello, I'm looking for a fundamentalist, please, you know. And he goes, well, I, you know, uh, this is, my name's Craig, and I'm not sure I can help you with that, but uh, yeah. So he tells me the whole story. They're looking for a fundamentalist to come to their class and so on. And uh, I said, you know, that sounds like a great deal of fun. I'd really like to come, but uh, I mean, can I help explain to you what a fundamentalist is? And so I started to explain, and he goes, yeah, yeah, do you want to do it or not? You know? I go, yeah, okay, I'll do it. Great. Be there at 8.30 next Wednesday. And he gave me the address and the building and all. Uh, 8.30 in an elective class at a community college, right? Now, I assume nobody's going to be there. So, uh, so I, I drive down to this thing. I get there nice and early. I find the, find the room. I go in, and, uh, and eventually students start to show up. It's early in the morning. They're looking bleary-eyed, as I thought they would. They're shuffling in, taking their seats. Some of them are carrying giant cups of coffee, though. So I, I have a feeling you might have a good time later on in the class as it progressed because that Starbucks kicked in, you know. So they settle in, and I meet a teaching assistant. The teaching assistant says, uh, hi, nice, nice to meet you. I said, hey, uh, I'd love to meet the, the teacher of the class. Is the professor here? And uh, the guy goes, mm, he's here. I go, can I meet him? He goes, uh, sure, he's over there. Now, he wasn't, like, bound up, but he wasn't using his arms. It was just kind of odd. He's going, he's over there. And I said, oh, uh, and there was a fellow sitting in the front row of seats all the way at the end, and, and uh, he had his head down on the little desk. And I'm thinking, oh, is he sick? And the guy goes, mm, no. <laughs> no explanation. I wasn't going to go over there and introduce me, myself to him. He looked like he might have the flu or something. I got the backstory later, actually. He, uh, towards the end of the term, when he turns over his class to guest speakers, he doesn't really have anything to do the night before, so he goes out and chases girls and, uh, and drinks a lot and comes in mostly hungover for a couple of weeks during the end of the term. So that was the backstory on this guy. 
But then I got this weird introduction. They're about to start. This, the class actually kind of filled up. It turns out that this is actually a popular thing at the college. A lot of these students have no contact with any kind of uh, you know, religious training at all. So this is their chance, you know, an elective class at a community college. And uh, so uh, they give me this introduction. Here is, I don't remember what they actually said during the introduction, but I remember how it felt. It felt like this. Here is Craig Hazen. His education most likely consisted of memorizing Bible verses <laughs> at, at, at Bill's Bible College in Feedlot, you know, so, so, something like that. Uh, so it was just all so weird. And, and I had this idea. Now, so, some of you might say, oh, you heard from God. Maybe, you know, I'm, not, I'm never sure I'm hearing from God, you know. Uh, my wife hears from God all the time, you know. She's really good at that. Yeah, it's usually uh, about something I should be doing, too. It's like, <laughs> but she's good at that. I mean, I have the spiritual sensitivity of plankton. So not too good at that. But I had this idea, and I, I mean, looking back on it, it was probably from God. Uh, the idea was, you have free reign here. And I did, that guy's sleeping down there, and I got this weird introduction. The students are mostly asleep. And so I said to the students, hey, it's great to be here. I can't wait to give you a talk now. I did prepare a wonderful talk on the history of the American fundamentalist movement, if you would like. And we, we could definitely go to, through that. That was my assignment. But I got to tell you, on the way down here, I was kind of excited about another idea. Because I know that you're all really smart students, and you're studying important things like astronomy and art history and ag agriculture and uh, accounting and anything else that starts with an A. Uh, <laughs> And you're very bright, and here you are. And I know a lot of you are in this class because you're exploring the various religions. Maybe you're even interested in signing up for one. And so you're in here taking them out for a little test drive. And so you want to see how, how Buddhism accelerates. <laughs> how Islam handles in the corners and so on, you know. And uh, so that's what I'd kind of like to do. I'd like to, I'd like to take you on a little journey on how would a thoughtful person like you go about a proper religious quest? Well, it was like the Starbucks kicked in at that moment. They're kind of going, whoop. <laughs> what did he say? Oh, we should do that. Totally. Yeah. Let's, let's do the questy thing you're talking about. <laughs> well, all right then. Guy's still out. All right, well, that's what we'll do. So, all right then. I, I, by the way, I had no idea where I was going with this, so complete reliance upon God. All right then. Um, so, it seems to me that if you're a thoughtful person and you're on a religious quest and you're exploring your various religious options, that you would obviously start that quest with Christianity. <laughs> Some of you have the same looks on your face that they did. Like, And so that was settling in, and then there was a guy in the middle of the room, actually right in the back, dead center. Uh, he's a, he had long, stringy, blonde hair. He's kind of like the local surfer guy, and he had a skateboard with him, you know. And, and it turns out that this guy was a lot smarter than he looked. Now, he was sitting, he was sitting next to two other surfer-looking guys, and they were actually no smarter than they looked. But, <laughs> but, but this guy in the middle... And, and so I make the statement about you got to start with Christianity if you're a thoughtful person. And he kind of raises his hand in this weird way, you know. <laughs> and I, I call on him. He goes, um, so like, I thought you weren't going to give us a lecture on fundamentalism, but the first thing you want to tell us is that we got to start with your religion because it's best. What's that about? Well, I think we're off and running. All right, let me do this. Let me give you five reasons why. By the way, people hate me in the morning at 8.30. So I'm like full of energy, even, even on drugs that take care of this. You know, I'm like, ha <laughs> so, <laughs> All right, then. Uh, here, let me give you five reasons why a thoughtful person on a religious quest would obviously start that quest with Christianity. I don't know why I picked five, you know. <laughs> I think I might have had two, you know, but... Uh, by the way, this, this was so influential on me, I ended up writing a book on this whole thing. Uh, it's called Five Sacred Crossings, if you actually want to get a hold of this. And it's actually a teaching on how Christianity is unique among the world religions. So let me give you five reasons. This morning, ladies and gentlemen, I will only be able to give you a couple of these. But So, uh, thing number one, 
right? Thing number one that sets Christianity apart from the great world religious traditions is that Christianity is testable. And they read to them that passage in 1 Corinthians 15 and uh, gave them some other fun pieces of evidence that uh, showed that Christianity was unique in that regard. So, uh, they actually thought that was good, all right? What else you got? So they're tracking me, all right? So, all right, the second reason that a thoughtful person on a religious quest would obviously start that quest with Christianity is that, it, that in Christianity, salvation is a free gift from God. It's a free gift from God. There's no, there's no crawling over jagged rocks for miles to put some offering in a temple. There's no sitting in arthritic lotus positions for hours on end, you know, hoping to move closer to enlightenment on an inward basis. There's nothing like that. He just gives it to you. What kind of religion is that? It's a very strange one, I admit. But my goodness, if that's the case, you know, uh, sign me up. That's a, that's a good one I want to test out. Uh, and by the way, these were college students, so they understood the concept of free rather well. Because they're, they're always looking for a free sandwich and a free haircut, free music download. Oh, wait, you know that already. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, the, yeah, so, so salvation in the system is free. And I read to them that famous passage in Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, that no one should boast. Um, and many other wonderful things that I tell them that morning on that particular point that you're not going to get. So, the third reason that a thoughtful person on a religious quest would obviously start that quest with Christianity is this. You get a tremendous worldview fit. You get a tremendous worldview fit in Christianity. In other words, Christianity paints a picture of the world that matches the way the world really is. This is a, usually a great illustration. Uh, Christianity paints a picture of the world that matches the way the world really is. I thought that was pretty good. I was kind of running out of ammunition at that point, and I thought, that, that's a good one. Uh, skateboard guy, who probably was a uh, part-time philosopher, he kind of raised his hand again. Um, excuse me, but sounds like now you're just saying stuff. <laughs> he was kind of right, <laughs> you know. Uh, so he goes, I mean, he actually made a good point. He goes, how are you going to possibly demonstrate that? I mean, you, anybody can just get there and say that, but to demonstrate that my, my religion or worldview uh, matches up with the way the world real, really is better than any other option seems like a bit of a stretch. I go, all right, valid point. So let me, let me narrow it down a bit. Let me pick one issue that I think can really uh, grab us all, and that's the problem of evil, pain, and suffering. All right? No matter what view of the world you have, no matter what religion you've signed up for, you have to deal with the problem of evil, pain, and suffering. <laughs> Every one of us has to deal with it. Uh, so how does Christianity deal with the problem of evil, pain, and suffering? And how do the other great world religions deal with it? Especially the Eastern religions, since there's a great contrast there, and we don't have a whole lot of time. I'm assuming, since you've been in this world religion survey class, you've, you've had a chance to look a bit at how Eastern religious traditions deal with evil, pain, and suffering. Which one of them paints a picture that matches the way the world really is? So they were okay with my example, so I said, all right, uh, how do Eastern religious traditions, by and large, deal with evil, pain, and suffering? Uh, they, they do this. This is the basic move by Eastern religious traditions. You simply rename evil, pain, and suffering. You call it maya. Maya, which is a Sanskrit term for illusion, right? You call it illusion or illusory, and then you work hard to assimilate that idea as deeply as you can through meditative practices and teachings and all kinds of, you kind of orient, orient your life to making that uh, an assimilated part. Uh, is, that, is that really painting a picture of the world the way the world really is? Just kind of calling it Maya and brushing it aside. Is that really gonna get us where we're going? said, I think not. I think that's not a good way to approach this, and I don't think it really answers the issue. Let me give you an example. 
Say the door's open in the back of the room and in walks an elderly woman. She's got a shock of gray hair and she's got a cane. And she makes her way down the chapel here, and she, or in this case, the classroom, and she sits right in front. Now, we don't get classroom invasions by elderly women very often, but so we say, uh, Madam, what's your story? And this old gal doesn't hesitate for a second. She stands up, turns to the class, and in a thick Polish accent, tells us this gripping tale of the Holocaust. When she was just a young girl in Poland one day, German troops come in and start rounding people up, stuffing them into boxcars and hauling them off to concentration camps. Uh, it was such a horrific journey. A lot of people just died on the way. They were stuffed in so tight. In the sweltering heat of, of August, uh, with no water and no facilities, people just died. They were throwing bodies off the train when they arrived. And once they got there, they were sorting people out. Some able-bodied people with some special talents went over to a small compound. Everybody else was herded into a giant compound with a couple of big smokestacks in the background. We know what was going on over there. This, this old woman, then a, a, a young girl, was herded off into the work campsite. The rest of her family, the rest of her village, off to the big uh, gas furnaces. After a couple of weeks, uh, of work on her fingers to the bone. She's nearly starved to death herself. She's just a little thing. She's wearing rags. She's, she's uh, barely surviving. And fortunately for her, the, the Red Army comes into that region of Poland and, and releases and, and uh, frees the camp. However, here stands this girl, just a teeny little thing. Everybody in her family's gone. Everybody in her village is gone. It's a uh, it's just a terrible situation from her. But somehow she was able to dust herself up, pick herself up, and, and march down through these decades. And here she stands before us telling us this gripping tale of the Holocaust. What are you going to say to her? Are you going to say to her, cheer up, lady. Turn that frown upside down. Just think happy thoughts, and the world will be your oyster. Is that what you're going to tell her? No! Why? Because she really suffered. You could call it Maya, you could call it illusion all day long, but she really suffered. That is a very weak view of the world when you talk to anybody who's gone through any amount of suffering. Christianity has a very different take on evil, pain, and suffering. We know that it's real and we face it head on. Our great calling as Christians is not to question whether evil is real or not, but it's to get down into the trenches where people are suffering and to bear them up the best we can in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who himself suffered dramatically, dying on a cross, dying for the sins of the world, and so on. Uh, Christianity uh, is a standout in handling this particular issue. And in terms of a comparative worldview basis, uh, Christianity paints a picture of the world that matches the way the world really is. We don't run away from evil, pain, and suffering. We face it head on. Now, I had time for one last shot at him. Uh, the, the class was ending. I could tell because students were packing up their backpacks. I didn't really know what time things stopped, but I figured it was getting close to the end. Although there was a door over here with a window in it, and there was a professor-looking fellow staring through it, tapping on his watch. That was another indicator that uh, <laughs> class was over. And so I said, all right, one more thing. One more thing, everybody. Uh, be be before you go, uh, one last issue. And that is, there's one other thing that sets Christianity apart. Uh, if, if you don't get this one, you miss everything. Uh, this is the one last thing that uh, if you don't buy into, you, uh, you miss out on all the goodies. Uh, uh, Christianity has Jesus at the center. If you're a thoughtful person on a religious quest, you want the religion that has Jesus at the center. Well, that gave a, an open door for a skateboard guy to question me one last time. And, and basically, he, he just shouted as the class was standing up and starting to walk out. I was, I was just aggrieved that he was getting the last word. But what he said was, oh my goodness, does everybody see what just happened? This was a lecture on fundamentalism after all. He was just waiting for the very last second to play the Jesus card. Bam! You know? Well, of course Jesus is at the center. It's Christianity. I go, you are missing a big point. Everybody stop for a second. You got to hear this. Uh, you see, uh, 
Sure, Jesus is at the center of Christianity, but did you know that every religion you've studied wants a piece of Jesus? They all want to grab him, change him up a little bit, and plunk him down near the center of their religion. Uh, Take Buddhism, for example. Many Buddhists think that Jesus might very well be a reincarnation of the Buddha himself. If not that, he's certainly a great bodhisattva, you know, a great wise Buddhist teacher of the past. Hindus. Many Hindus believe that Jesus is an actual avatar of Vishnu, an incarnation of that Hindu deity. If they don't go that far, they'll they'll agree with somebody like Gandhi who thinks that Jesus was certainly uh, ranked among the top religious teachers uh, the earth has ever seen. Islam, for goodness sakes. In Islam, Jesus emerges as a figure greater than Muhammad himself. Uh, Jesus, uh, Muhammad's a prophet, no doubt about that in Islamic tradition, but so is Jesus. But in addition, Jesus was born of a virgin, was a legitimate miracle worker, and will stand with Allah at the scales of judgment at the end of time. I'm not sure of the exact score, but it's something like Jesus 4, Muhammad 1, you know. Uh, But it doesn't matter what the score is. Jesus has been at the center of Christianity since the very beginning. So if you're a thoughtful person on a religious quest, you really ought to start that quest with Christianity. I just scooped my stuff off the lectern and just walked out a side door, just kept on walking until I got to some picnic tables on the campus. I dumped my stuff, and I noticed there was a line of students coming out of that same rarely used door, you know. It didn't really lead anywhere. So I'm out there, and they start to encircle me. <laughs> this is a, I, I've actually, I've had to be escorted off of a campus or two by campus security for my safety. So this this didn't look great. Fortunately, they were not hurling sharp objects. They had some sharp questions that they still had. And it turned into kind of an all-day seminar, I know, because it was still morning. We were drinking coffee, eating pastries. Pretty soon it was sandwiches and Diet Coke at lunch. And uh, afternoon, something or other. We didn't make it to dinner time, but oh my goodness. They just had so many questions, but it all stemmed from the idea that Christianity is objectively investigatable. It's testable. And that sets Christianity apart in dramatic fashion. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.